Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. Welcome to this webinar organized by Clean Horizon. We will start in another minute, uh, just waiting for uh, another member of, of Clean Horizon to dial in before we start and a couple of other participants to join. Um, so in the meantime, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Quentin Bachet. Uh, and you can, I, I work, been working for Clean Horizon for the past five years and I'll be presenting this webinar with Michael Solomon, who's uh, dialing it at the minute, and uh, we'll lead you through our uh, leaderboard, which essentially summarizes the key, um, well, the, the, the leaders in the energy storage space uh, in, uh, up to date. Okay, good afternoon or good good evening, good morning or good afternoon or good evening everybody. This is Michael Salomon here. So thank you, Quarantine, for the um the um uh the introduction. I think I still see people piling up in the um in the attendees list. So if you don't mind, I'll just wait for, for another second or two uh just to make sure we're all there. Uh in the meantime, I just want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Yes, maybe you can go to full screen. Oh yeah, but here it's not the good uh, screen, Michael. I think you just need to change. We're seeing the presentation mode now. There you go. Okay. Um, All right. No. no, still, still not. Okay. I'll do this this way. And in the meantime, everyone, feel free to ask questions as we move along in the in the question box. Um, so there is a, a question um, box where we'll, we'll take them uh, either as we go or at the end of uh, of the webinar. And Michael, somehow it's blank now. Okay. Well, how about that? Okay. So. There you go. Voilà. I think it should be a bit more seeable now. It's well, otherwise, yeah. Well, it's still blank again somehow, Michael. There you go. Bon, oh. but this will be a small screen. Okay. okay. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, there's a, you can there's zoom a in of everyone. With yes, your mouse. There's, there's, there's a bunch of people uh, here, so I think we're just going to get started. Uh, you know, after one and a half year of coronavirus, it still it seems like some people still do not fully master the art of webinar and Zoom meetings, which is you know should be a a glimmer of hope that you know the 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 normal life of the world of before is not completely forgotten. So, in any case, thanks for attending. Um, it's five past, so we'll just uh, we'll just get started now. Uh, uh, we, uh, as as most of you know, we are Clean Horizon. We are the uh, energy storage experts. We define ourselves as a one-stop shop energy storage consultant, basically meaning that we can take on any question relating to uh, energy storage be it market analysis or, or technical consulting. And the purpose of this presentation is to share with you, with the audience, what, uh, uh, an effort we do, we do twice a year, uh, which we call the leaderboard, where we uh, uh, aggregate our understanding of um, of where each players are, where every player is, is in the industry, and try to give you some kind of benchmark to work with. Uh, before we get started, I just want to, I, um, I just want to, drag uh, your attention or to, 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 to make you clearly notice that we, uh, where our data comes from. So our data comes from uh, uh, our database, database that we uh, maintain, which we call CHESS. CHESS uh, could be read as a C-H-E-S-S, so Clean Horizon uh, ESS, which we use as an acronym for Energy Storage Source, where basically every week, uh, we, we update uh, this online database where we track and, and store data on every megawatt level project around the world that fits certain criteria. So bear with me on the criteria. Um, 
uh, this is just how it looks uh, when you uh, when you become a subscriber uh, basically this this uh, uh, the criteria that the projects need to uh, need to to fit is that they need to be I, I want to say it verifiable projects so anything that's confidential or for which we don't really have a precise site uh, is not included anything that is a pipeline um, generic issue on a pipeline or generic numbers on the portfolio of specific developers is not included rather we need to be able to, to precisely locate each project in our database uh, and that actually uh, filters out a lot of it. And of course, uh, everything needs to be non-confidential uh, because um, uh, some projects uh, uh, that we may be aware of are actually confidential and we obviously are, are not at a liberty to put it in the database. Um, okay, so as uh, as we get started, uh, and also I want to I want to stress that uh, it's it's very likely that all of the vendors that attend this conversation are going to feel in a way misrepresented and that's certainly because of what i've just said now which is anything that is not publicly available and publicly verifiable is not is not included in the database okay so i will be presenting a data on what i call the global market size and then the ranking of each leaderboard and Corey will be presenting uh, some aspects of a, uh, uh, our vision of forecasts we are making and we made actually a few months ago on Europe and which we're happy to share uh, with you today. Uh, so first thing, uh, in our database, in, in the CHESS database, we report on, um, on projects uh, that are at various st stages of uh, maturity, uh, meaning projects that are uh, uh, operational, uh, under construction and announced. A project is usually announced before it gets under construction and operational. And what we call announced means there is a, a credible public announcement, what we think is a credible public announcement or public, um, publicly available information that a project is seriously going to be built. So for example, uh, what we deem as a not credible announcement is for a project to be in some interconnection queue in a given country because it doesn't cost a lot to place a project into the interconnection queue but some some elements that we believe will be more credible in terms of uh, uh, validating if you wish an announcement could be either uh, um, uh, could be for example the fact that yes the project is in some kind of interconnection queue or and has won or and or has won some kind of tender and by the way there has been a press release by the owner or press release by one of the main stakeholder okay so if we get uh, you know this kind of information we will deem the project to be credibly announced so what i put on this graph is at the end of each calendar year since 2008 the the amount of megawatt of projects that had been announced during that specific calendar year okay so the, first of all there's no repetition a project cannot be announced twice so if you see a curve increasing it means that there were more project in terms of megawatt announced in the given year than in, in the previous year and what you're seeing here which actually is a, um, a probably a testimony to a, a lot of things that happened in the last quarter is that uh, the coronavirus pandemic didn't hit really strong <laughs> in terms of the storage industry um, has probably not even affected at all uh, the exponential curve that we were starting to see since 2017 or 2018 and in terms of 2021 where we are right now i i don't need you i don't need you to make a a, a rule uh you know a rule of thumb of some kind of proportionality computation but as you see we're not at the half of the year and we're already way above a half of the amounts of megawatt that were announced last year so uh, yes, I think all of us around this um, virtual table see this in our daily lives that energy storage is, um, uh, you know, uh, subject to huge growth in terms of uh, various business opportunities, and we don't see any kind of a, a change in that trend. I mean, even a global pandemic has not affected it. Uh, needless to say, that announcements of 2020 do not mean procurement operations of 2020. Actually, as most of you may know, if not, I'm, I'm happy to to uh, to give you this information. It takes between the moment where I would say 
uh, uh, some kind of design is being made or some kind of announcement is being made or a project in an actual procurement it may you may see it maybe one year or sometimes even longer uh, and then even longer year between uh, even longer between the actual procurement and uh, uh, the time where the project is effectively commissioned um, for example you know, you you may have seen or in your various uh, adventures that in a given country, uh, a given PPA was awarded to uh, 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 an IPP at a specific location. Uh, this IP, this PPA may be for PV plus storage. We would count that in uh, as a project that's announced this year, but. Uh, um, the PPA may have indication that the project needs to be commissioned, say, by 2023 or 2024. So it means that if the PPA is signed today for a COD a commissioning date of 2023, the procurement probably will take place at some point in 2022, right? So those numbers there that we're, that we're showing are an excellent indicator, not so much of what's in a way of what's happening today, but really it's an indicator of tomorrow's business for system integrators or anyone selling or buying storage or financing storage for that matter. Uh, okay, so if I go next. Okay, well, like that. So another way to see this uh, a kind of a, a very high level uh, a global market view, what I showed now is I just showed the numbers year on year only looking at the announced project. Another way to look at it is to look at the status now. It's really now, actually the data is from to be very open, the data is from next week because we're still up, up, upgrading, up, uploading data into our database, so it, it cannot be fresher data. But if you look at what we have now in the industry in terms of projects that are still announced in the announced stage under construction or operational, what you see, uh, first of all, what you can't see and I don't want you to see is if you go to the next, if you see the 32 gigawatt of projects announced, it is not related to the amount of projects announced here. Because as you may see, as you may understand, a project that was announced in the past in the past may be now operational under construction or may have gone cancelled. So those numbers cannot be seen, um, cannot be compared. They're, they're, they're from a different vantage point. But still, what you see is that if you if you sum up what's operational or under construction, uh, we're barely at 15 gigawatt. Whether we have twice that in terms of announced projects, so it's just another way to tell you that the industry, even though it's growing super fast and, and has real assets in the field or almost in the field, it's still growing at an exponential rate because we have twice more in preparation that we have on the field. In terms of the technologies that are used for storage, by the way, uh, same idea, as you see that pie chart here, when I look at all the industry there, uh, everything, almost everything is lithium ion. The, the, the items that are not lithium ion are actually, a lot of them are actually from the older projects that are still operational. And see, I have a couple, uh, I think a few percent that I consider to be unknown. They're unknown because to be very frank, they're still announced and I'm not yet sure they're gonna be lithium ion. So I just say it's unknown, but the proportion of lithium ion, uh, whether you see it in megawatt or megawatt hour, it doesn't really matter. The proportion of lithium ion within new projects is probably closer to 95 or 99 percent than, than it is closer to 90 percent. So that proportion of lithium ion is very likely to keep increasing at least next year. Okay. Um, okay, whatever. All right. So uh, that was for just a, just a very high level overview. And what I'd like to do now is provide, as I said, a, a leaderboard of uh, of, of players involved in industry. So before I do this, I just want to get uh, a share a very, very high level uh, definitions. I'm, I'm going to be, this is a very, very high level view of the industry, okay? Um, uh, hopefully I'm not offending anybody, but uh, the, um, the uh, 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 I'm going to be looking at uh, uh, what, I, what we call system integrators and project developers slash owners. Uh, what I call system integrator for the purpose of this presentation and actually in my everyday life uh, in the storage space is essentially a turnkey provider which provides the battery. Michael, sorry yes. I'm interrupting, but can you make your, your, your windows a little bit smaller just so that we can see the full smaller? Smaller, yeah, again, yeah, okay, and maybe click on home on the top left corner, click on home. 
Sure. At once. Yeah, it's just it's a bit louder. Okay. So now okay. I think. Sorry, we we there's a bug somehow. We can't go to full screen mode because yeah. there's happens in the I chat. I apologize. I just Should apologize for this. No. Okay. Um, Thanks, Michael. Please, please complain, because you deserve uh, to complain, and we deserve to be complained at. Um, uh, Michael and needs to improve. <laughs> we need to improve. Thank you. So um, the. Uh, um, what we call system integrator are essentially uh, is the is the, the the player in charge for the turnkey system provision, whether it's a company that also builds the battery and the PCS or whether it's a company because it's a company that integrates batteries and PCS made by others doesn't really matter for this ranking. In the end, they're competing uh, for the same share of the market. Uh, and on the other hand, I've, I, I've voluntarily mixed in this presentation project developers and, and investors slash owners. We understand that a developer is not an IPP, is not an investor, but for the sake of this project, we sort of group that together so that everything is simpler to read. Okay, so hopefully, uh, and yeah, by the way, I'm reminding everybody, so yes, 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 uh, uh, vendors understand, everybody's gonna be disappointed at those numbers because because we do not include anything that is confidential. I stress that once more, but please complain again. Uh, okay, so in terms of system integrator, this is this is where we stand now. So first of all, uh, uh, I'm gonna show you what it is, what we have now, as of pretty much now, or this week, and I'll show you how it differs from what we had exactly last year. Believe it or not, we made a leaderboard presentation on May 11th, 2020, so exactly 365 days uh, in the past. So what you see, for those of you that are familiar with the industry, you should see names that you're familiar with. Uh, there are some players, obviously, that are very global, like maybe Tesla or Fluence, uh, some that may be more located in some geographies, but to some degree, maybe Nidec has more uh, strength in Europe, uh, uh, slightly in the US. Hyosung is maybe more uh, um, uh, in Asia, uh, same as LGCNS. And GE, who's a, who's a global player. Uh, uh, the first thing, so you see that ranking gives you more or less uh, the top, um, I think it's the top 15 or top 10, we should count. Um, in any case, all of the ones that have over 100 megawatts of references according to the way we rank that, we, we classify those references. Uh, it also tells you that if you look at the sum here, your FAR, which is probably just a few gigawatt, you're, you're, you're maybe barely at 50% of the amount of install assets uh, that I mentioned earlier. And this is for multiple reasons. First of all, there are a lot of players that actually uh, are not including here because they don't have hundreds of megawatts uh, of references. Also, there are some references that are not known to us or that are known to us and that we cannot uh, share because they are one way or another confidential. Now, if you look at what this number was last year, uh, first of all, what you see is that uh, first thing, Last year, we were still ranking projects for NEC. So uh, those of you that have been in the industry for, for a while know that NEC ES was one of the leaders um, until uh, the, uh, the parent company decided to stop uh, pursuing the energy source system integration business. So we, we could still technically have this player into the 2021 leaderboard. However, we, were, we, we, we removed it because we wanted to give indication of, of where the market is active. The reason NEC um, uh, 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 was taken out is that it's, it's no longer a player that you can um, ask an, uh, a quotation to. But you see that regardless, uh, Fluence and Tesla were still at the time, uh, uh, you, you know, essentially on par, but that what happened was uh, some companies uh, got, um, I would say, popped up in that top 10 list, such as SunGrow, and push back players such as NIDEC or RES that have had, um, I would say, a, a small, a, a slower progression. And you see um, a company like ABB, for example, as you can see, as you probably just saw earlier, uh, uh, appear, so with new references, and some players like Varzilla and G that are still uh, uh, part of that, of that top 10 or top 15 list. Now, Another way to see those players, so back to present data, is to sort of a, try to get an overview for beyond the numbers in terms of megawatt, trying to show, first of all, the amount of not just megawatt, but megawatt hour those companies, uh, those, 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 those players um, uh, can claim in terms of reference, and also 
to show uh, uh, also the number of projects and what kind of international coverage those companies have. And what you see, it, it was already standing out last year, and it, I think it's, it's very clear this year, there really are two companies that are standing out in terms of, uh, I would say, the, the amount of countries for which we have reference uh, references, for which we know of some actual references, uh, and also, so those two companies being Fluence and Tesla, and also you can see that those two companies seem to be much more proactive on projects that are to the right of that dash curve. So those projects tend to be projects with more, uh, with a C rate that's below one, so with projects that are longer duration, and which is probably a very good testimony that those companies are very aggressively starting to address the, the larger opportunities we see worldwide, which tend to be four hour and plus duration. Um, okay, so that's our leaderboard for what we call the system integrator. And now I'd like to make the same for the so-called project developer, which again are mixing project developer and investors, and it's and it's on purpose. Okay, so the numbers as they stand uh, today, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show two sets of numbers. I'm going to show uh, just to be, I would say, um, uh, on par with what I just showed. I will show these references first. This leaderboard first on. Um, uh, operational projects, so projects that are on the ground functioning, and as you can see, a lot of the key and and you know massively um, uh, um, uh, leading this this um, this, uh, this this leaderboard are based in the U.S. with the example with the exception of uh, maybe uh, Kepco AES being uh, across the Americas, and some projects some some owners being. Um, uh, in the UK and then international players, maybe like Nguyen and a bunch of others in the UK and elsewhere. Now, this is when I look at this number, I'm, I'm just looking at the assets that are deployed as of today, which does not give me a great amount of indication. Remember that project developer, uh, uh, the project developers are the ones sort of pooling the industry because they are the ones essentially winning the various government tenders or bidding into the market, and they are the ones who end up in the end purchasing assets from, from vendors. So it's probably better to look not so much in terms of uh, operational projects, but rather in terms of announced projects, because those projects that are still announced are for most, most of them not yet procured, and they are gonna set the trend for who are going to be the key buyers in the year or the one or two years to come. And as you can see, there's a, uh, so this is the numbers as of today. Um, I, I, will, I, will, I will comment them for, for minutes and then I'll show you the numbers for last year, the exact same document that was done last year. So Nextera, with no surprise, is clearly uh, the leader with all of the, um, I would say the, the projects that they have mostly uh, in North America. There has been, if some of you have read the press lately, they have, there has been some very impressive announcements in the Philippines actually over the past few months. Uh, which probably is why, uh, fine, which certainly is why uh, Solar Philippines is uh, popped up on this ranking. Uh, Neon, which is a French IPP, actually active in multiple countries, has been leading uh, one of the leaders of this uh, of this uh, uh, ranking for year for, for many years. And you'll find uh, after that a, a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, players such as Hecate Energy, um, Eight Minute Solar, and etc. Now, if you compare as a you know for for uh, out of curiosity, those numbers with the ones from last year. Well, first of all, obviously, the bar chart goes less, goes lower because obviously there's there's much more. Uh, there are many more projects, megawatts of projects at least this year than there was last year. Hence, yet another testimony of the growth we are seeing in our industry. And uh, I would say the difference between this year and last year is that uh, uh, developers involved in the UK were higher up in that ranking. Um, and with no surprise, we're seeing geographies that are becoming more active than the UK. So the US that, are, that has always been very active is still more and more active. And as I mentioned, we're seeing uh, 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 new developments in the Philippines. And there are players, as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I mentioned Neowen. Neowen is active in multiple countries. And I guess uh, uh, um, uh, there's the... Uh, now, the growth in countries outside of the top three or four countries has not been as 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 important as it has been in the top three countries, which have been this year, uh, as I mentioned, mostly um, uh, U.S. and actually Australia. 
Okay, so these are the numbers. We'll, uh, um, I will now uh, slowly transition this presentation to, to Corey. Uh, Corey is going to, to present you some numbers that we prepared uh, last December, as a matter of fact. Those numbers stem from uh, a monthly analyst note, which we call Update from the Field, which is published every month. Uh, so even though we made those numbers five months ago, we still think they're true. Uh, and I think Corey will be glad to uh, introduce them and um, and uh, and uh, commenting on them. In the meantime, I'm going to see if we have any questions, and I will try to uh, answer in the chat box while Corey has the, um, uh, you know, takes the lead. So Corey, if you're Thanks. ready. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, and good morning, everyone, for those who joined. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to take you through um, our uh, European forecast hub. So I'll just get presenting mode again. And share my screen. So hub. Michael, can you confirm you can see my screen? I can confirm I cannot see your screen. Oh, there you go, I can see your screen. Very good, excellent. Okay, fantastic. Right, um, so what what uh, what we're sharing here is just a brief outline of um, of what what, uh, what was in the report in December. Everything's not there, so uh, you still have to subscribe to our reports to benefit from most of the content. But here's some idea of uh, what we what we've shared um, uh, on our knowledge on, on Europe. So we've we've taken a look at 26 countries in Europe, so more than the European Union, and we well they're actually segmented in. Um, in, in a, a couple of uh, regional groups, that's how they're called uh, from, a, uh, from a European grid perspective. Uh, so there's the continental uh, Europe grid, which has uh, Australia, uh, sorry, Austria, France, uh, Germany, uh, Italy, Spain, and so on. That's the dark blue one that you have here. There's um, the UK, um, which, which is actually only Great Britain. Uh, and there's Ireland, which is both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And finally, there's the Nordics here, which are a bit specific, um, as well as um, the Baltic grids. Uh, so that's the purple uh, here. So why have we segmented them like this in our analysis? Because the revenue streams are actually quite depending on, um, on these network zones because of the services that are shared in the grid. So the way we've built this uh, this forecast is a quite a conservative manner. In other words, um, we the numbers you will see in the next slides are based on today current accessible revenue streams. So we are not uh, considering opening of new uh, revenue streams for battery projects that will be deployed in the next uh, five years throughout Europe. So we, we really base this on today's accessible revenue streams to try and understand how this can move forward in the next five years. Um, so a bit more on the methodology. Up. Uh, on the methodology itself, uh, we've, done, uh, we've done this exercise of first assessing for each of these countries um, the current revenue streams. That means um, frequency regulation, which is still the biggest driver for storage deployment across Europe. That also means um, fast frequency regulation products whenever they are awesome, uh, which is true for Great Britain, Ireland, um, Italy, um, and that's it for today. Um, there's also the so we've said ancillary services capacity mechanism. There's also all the uh, all the reserve markets that's uh, secondary and tertiary reserves, and then there's all the electricity market. That's the the the, the penultimate column here, which is essentially um, day ahead uh, spot market, intraday market, and the balancing market. Uh, so that's that's the free market. You can do arbitrage on with a battery. Uh, and finally, um, I've mentioned them, the, the capacity market. Uh, there's today, uh, well, the countries in Europe where there's one accessible is um, France, Italy, Belgium, Ireland, um, Great Britain here. Poland is in the process of having one. 
Italy, uh, Spain uh, also it has just published uh, new drafts for a new capacity mechanism. So a lot of ex new exciting stuff uh, in these countries for storage. And based on this revenue analysis and the size of each of those markets, so we've sized FCR markets, we've sized uh, secondary reserve arbitrage and capacity markets for storage and try and estimate um, how much storage could be deployed uh, having viable revenues. And we've come up with um, the, the result. So again, the conservative result that uh, from two gigawatt currently installed today, you should see uh, in 2025, eight gigawatt of storage deployed in Europe. So again, in storage, we, Michael mentioned it in the database, but we exclude Pent Hydro, and it's only taking into account utility scale, storage projects um, that are connected to the grid. So anything that is behind the meter, uh, not utility scale, meaning less than 500 kilowatts, is not accounted here. So that's a multiplication by four of market size throughout Europe um, uh, in, within, the, the, within five years. Um, you can see, uh, so red means the opportunity is not so big today and green means it's good. So you can see that uh, pretty much all countries in our forecast do adopt a bit of storage. Um, so there are several, several reasons for this. So some countries um, like um, Germany, UK, Spain, uh, France have increased storage capacity to participate in the various different markets. And uh, this is mainly due to accumulation of uh, frequency regulation revenues, capacity markets in those countries, um, and um, yeah, and the reserves for uh, for some uh, like uh, Portugal, where secondary reserve revenues are accessible. And there are others, especially in the east, um, like uh, Ukraine, like um, Lithuania, that have that are using storage but they don't have really markets today and the reason for that is uh there it's very simple is that they want to join the NSOE and they're uh, leaving the russian uh, grid so they are decoupling um to join NSOE so they need additional reserves because they can't rely on um the russian grid um system and so they're they're purchasing or they're um, purchasing FCR capacity on their own. And so that's the two, the reason why you can see uh, Lithuania and Ukraine here stepping up uh, from zero today with, uh, um, with an opportunity 2025. However, this is not a market-based opportunity on the contrary to other countries because it's, it's um, not a market for developers. It's a market for uh, integrators because they will be tenders for these capacities, but it's not really open markets. It won't be open markets at least. In the rest of European countries, it is uh, real tangible uh, market opportunities, meaning any developer can seize their chance. In the Nordics, um, it might, so the opportunity is not huge. You can see a couple hundred megawatts there. Um, essentially, the price for primary frequency regulation there is quite uh, attractive. The revenue is called FCRN for uh, it's kind of FCR, so frequency control, um, frequency containment reserve, and it's quite attractive. Right. Um, so now going uh, maybe showing the, the same thing but on a different kind of graph um, on this slide you can see um, the, 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 the countries but they are ranked uh, this time uh, based on uh, the amount of storage being deployed and our forecast and the number of projects announced. So you can see that uh, UK is is uh, is first is the first country there, and I'll touch a word on it because it's what's well, the largest market for storage uh, today in Europe, uh, followed uh, by Germany. Uh, the, so UK is essentially driven by ancillary services and more and more uh, arbitrage on, uh, on on the wholesale markets and uh, the balancing mechanism. Germany has a Nets booster projects plus a renewable plus storage project plus FCR market, so it's it's getting up to 1,000 megawatts. Italy is really the the new entrant in this in this ranking with the recent capacity market auction 
plus the fast reserve tender, so enabling these two key revenue streams for storage. So we see it as a kind of a similar path to the UK, and I'll go a bit more into this. Belgium uh, comes next with a um, high, high, I mean a high level of um, issues regarding generation, the capacity market, which is now uh, open. So um, I think applications have to be submitted before the summer for this capacity market. High uh, secondary reserve prices uh, and a couple of uh, of, um, of interesting subjects uh, there in Belgium. Uh, you can see that Ireland is one of the rare uh, countries where our forecast is a bit lower than the volume of announced projects. That's because we believe the market is not so deep. So there's only four. We believe there will be only 400 megawatt of storage built in uh, 2025. Uh, and there's more than this announced, a bit more than 500 megawatts. That's because we believe uh, some of the projects will be commissioned after 2025 amongst those announced. The market is not so deep uh, today, especially the frequency regulation market with the cap and uncapped uh, auction. And then comes uh, comes France with uh, interesting uh, interesting elements such as capacity market and and uh, and uh, NFCR market and new elements to come up such as the opening of the secondary reserve market uh, early next year. Um, then then you have Netherlands with a high uh, high intermittency uh, so big drivers for storage. I won't go through all of them, I'll be reassured, but just giving the key drivers probably for the top five or 10 countries. Spain has very ambitious uh, storage targets. The reason why it's quite low in our ranking at 250 megawatts is that today, um, so there's a lot of uh, government efforts uh, to push storage, but the direction has not be, been chosen yet. So the capacity market is likely to be uh, the next thing which will drive storage deployment. But for now, there's no key revenues and we don't know um, how the how, what will be the results of the capacity market. So it might be uh, that it's not favorable for storage or that revenues are too low. So that's why it, it might seem a bit low to those of you who track the goal of the Spanish uh, market, which is in, in gigawatt uh, of storage for 2025. Right, and then you have the Lithuanian and Ukraine grids, uh, which, needs res which need reserves to leave the uh, unified uh, power system of, of Russia. Uh, so that's um, interesting uh, topics to, to, to keep in mind. Right, so let me um, take a brief look at two of these opportunities uh, out of the three first countries in our ranking, uh, which is Great Britain and Germany. And uh, so on Great Britain first, I've just um, shown here what is the the volume of uh, of battery storage systems providing dynamic containment so dynamic containment is the auction in great britain for frequency regulation it's a daily auction meaning um, you bid um, today for tomorrow as a 24-hour delivery product so you need to uh, be committed to deliver frequency regulation during the whole day the price for this service is 17 pounds per megawatt per hour so which is uh, relatively interesting uh, well actually very interesting if you compare it to uh, other frequency revenues elsewhere we expect this market to saturate at some point in the future um, you can see that there's currently close to 600 megawatts of batteries pre-qualified uh, on this uh, on this uh, on this tender so the the number of batteries pre-qualified is the, the maximum of the red line if you want and in blue, what you can see is the, var uh, the spreads on the balancing mechanism. So it's the, the maximum price on the balancing mechanism minus the minimum price on the balancing mechanism. And what's interesting to note is that you can see battery storage system leaving the dynamic containment auctions days where uh, the spreads on the balancing mechanism are interesting. What this means is that um, for more and more of the assets, are uh, committed to delivering both frequency regulation and arbitrage depending on system conditions. So it means that some days um, battery storage system can make more than 17 uh, times 24 pounds uh, for each megawatt of storage during the day. 
on uh, so that although in other words doing arbitrage is more profitable than providing frequent regulation so that's in an, an interesting trend which we expect to see uh, happening throughout Europe as the frequency regulation markets saturate uh, or uh, get uh, uh, decreasing revenues because um, uh, for, well, for various reasons actually so arbitrage to take more and more uh, a share of the of the business case is quite likely to happen right i'm just checking if there are some questions we're close to uh... all right so there's one question actually uh on the on the uk uh storage markets isn't the question um is is the market going to be saturated well for now what you can see here is that uh, we haven't reached the threshold where um there couldn't be more batteries um, participating in the dynamic containment auction. What happens today is that the volume of dynamic containment procurement increases faster than the volume of pre-qualified assets. Um, and that's still probably going to be the trend until Q3 this year, because National Grid needs, from a system perspective, more and more dynamic containment. Uh, and as assets pre-qualify, at some point, we expect this price of 17 pounds per megawatt per hour, which is the price of the alternative for national grid, to decrease. Today, it's it's not the case. And, and well, it's difficult to say exactly when this will happen, but I'd say Q3, from Q3 when this year we should start, or maybe in late this year, we should see dynamic containment prices reduce as uh, participants, volume of participants should reach uh, procurement size. An interesting country, which is a bit, which has a, a lot of fundamental drivers that look a lot like the UK, and that's actually why we've put them in the trajectory to one gigawatt in 2025. If you look back at the UK, um, the UK market grew from uh, zero to one gigawatt from 2016 to 2020. Because if you remember, uh, in the in the storage industry, 2016 was the EFR tender and hence frequency response, which is actually the exact same thing or close to the exact same thing as the fast reserve tender that occurred um, last year in Italy. And the fast reserve tender awarded 230 megawatts of batteries. Uh, and the EFR back in 2016 awarded the 200 megawatt of batteries, so it's similar. In both countries, there is a capacity market that is accessible to energy storage system. So that's why uh, we expect um, the Italian market to kind of follow uh, the track of the, the UK. We believe it's not going to go much faster because Terna still has to adapt all of their ancillary services fleet to open them to storage. And those of you who are joining from the UK can tell how long it took uh, for markets to open up for storage, for balancing mechanism to be open to storage. So um, these, these revenues of uh, capacity markets and frequency regulation should, we believe, end up in a market in Italy of approximately one gigawatt in 2025 based on uh, the revenues accessible today. Um, in the next slides, we have, and you, you can download the slides already in the, in the, in the box, but we'll, and, we'll, and we'll make them accessible uh, via an email after this webinar. Um, we detail for each country the key drivers here, um, the accessible revenue streams and their size. So we've done that for probably the top 10 countries in Europe. So it's only an extract, but that's, that enables you to see our approach, which is, I believe, quite pragmatic to understand um, how we did the forecast of these, um, of these European markets. So I'll leave it for you to read. Um, here is a bit more data. In any case, um, we are just, as of today, the, the, the two most interesting things to follow in Europe are probably the capacity mechanism uh, in the process of opening both in Spain and in Belgium. Uh, that's where we expect uh, store. I mean, storage will be allowed to participate. The only question is how much will storage be able to make in terms of revenue and how much um, storage will be awarded. So that's uh, very positive news. 
stay tuned. There are, there are revenues that we haven't mentioned really here. It's just like secondary reserve. We, we happen to have a webinar soon on, um, on secondary reserves uh, in Europe. And uh, please make sure you follow us either on the social uh, networks or uh, on our top five to make sure you can dial into this next webinar uh, on uh, secondary reserve. And I think, uh, well, that's it for, for, for me on the European forecast. Let me look if there's any other question. No, I think in terms of the questions, I think I've, I've answered them while you were talking. So it should be okay. Maybe you should just uh, leave on the, the, the next slide so people can see uh, contacts if needed. And I just want to thank you again um, um, for, um, for your interest in our, uh, in our work. Uh, apologize for our poor master mastering of the uh, of the webinar tool, and also um, as Corey said, we will be sharing um, the uh, the presentation just after this. If you have any question, I think all of you registered, so you know how to reach us. If you still don't, uh, you can write at any of those addresses below, or my personal address if you have it, or Corey's personal address. Anyways, we'll we'll receive it either way. And um, we will have another webinar early June, specifically focused on second reserve. So do not you worry, we will not be the ones uh, doing the technical part of the webinar. So it's going to be just lovely. And uh, we look forward to your question and feedback and speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Have Bye -bye. a good day. Bye.